Good morning, Calvario. How are you this morning? Amen. And before we begin worship, I just want to wish a happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Couldn't do it without you. Couldn't find mom without you, right? I'm always asking where mom is instead of asking them. But we thank God for all the fathers out there, for all the godly fathers especially. And I just want to read this verse in Proverbs 27. It says, the godly walk with integrity. Blessed are their children who follow them. I just want to uh, thank all you fathers out there for everything you do. But especially we want to thank our celestial father, amen, for the love that he showed us first. Why don't we stand and begin our worship? Come. 
to the end of the sail. Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness is part with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide.
Hey dads, we know it's really good to see you. I know you may not hear this a lot, but uh, we love you. And we hope you understand how important and how special it is that you're here. You know, there's probably a hundred things you could be doing today, but you're here with us. And it means a lot. You don't have an easy job. Parenting comes with incredible challenges. And sometimes it's hard to know if you're doing it right. But you should know that being here right now, it's an important part. In the Old Testament, God gave this command, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. These words that I command you today should be on your heart. You should teach them diligently to your children. You should talk of them when you sit in your house or when you're walking down the street. Talk of them from the time you get up in the morning to when you fall asleep at night. So what does it mean to be a good father? It means loving God with all of your heart soul and might, and teaching your kids to do the same. And what an amazing example it is that you're here in the house of God, in the presence of other believers, seeking more of Jesus and worshiping unashamed. The young men and women here see you. The kids are watching, and as they grow, they'll remember and do the same. So thank you, dads. Thank you for your presence and example. We pray that God will bless you today. Renew your spirit and draw you closer to him so you can continue to be a shining influence to all those around you. Happy Father's Day. Good morning and happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. And um, we just hope that you're blessed today in this time that we share together. You know, I was just kind of uh, wondering about this whole concept of Father's Day and its origins. So I did a little research this week, and um, I found out, first of all, that the United States is one of the few countries in the world that has an official day on which fathers are honored by their children. Many countries have Mother's Day, but Father's Day is, is, is not even on their calendars. But here on the third Sunday of June, fathers across the country are given presents, treated to dinner, or otherwise made to feel special. But what are the origins of this celebration? Where, 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 where do we get this from? Well, some say it began as early uh, as 1908 in a church service uh, when they had a Father's Day celebration. And um, whether or not, you know, there, there's some discrepancy there, but our celebration, our holiday, can be traced back all the way to 1909. When Mrs. Sonora Dodd of Spokane, Washington, she wanted to have, find a special day to honor her father. You see, her father, William Smart, was a Civil War veteran. And he was widowed when his wife was giving birth to their sixth child. So Mr. Smart was, was uh, left to raise these six children, and uh, five children and a newborn, all by himself in this rural farm in the state of Washington. Now, when Sonora became an adult, she realized the selflessness her father had shown in raising the children as a single parent. 
It was her father that made all the parental sacrifices and was, in her eyes, a courageous, selfless, and loving man. So in 1909, Mrs. Dodd approached her pastor and other ministers there in Spokane about having a church service dedicated to fathers, and she wanted it on June 5th, which was her father's birthday. But since the date was too close in proximity to what her pastor could do, they pushed it off a couple weeks to June 19th. And from then on, in the state of Washington, they celebrated on the third Sunday of June, Father's Day. And that's when children made special desserts or went out to visit their fathers if they lived apart. Well, the states and the organizations caught wind of what was happening in Washington. And they started lobbying Congress to make this nationwide. So in 1916, President Woodrow Wilson approved of this idea, but it wasn't until 1924 that it became a national event. And since then, fathers have been honored and recognized by their families throughout our country on the third Sunday of June. It wasn't until 1966 that President Lyndon Johnson signed a presidential proclamation declaring the third Sunday of June as Father's Day and put it on an official stamp, and uh, and so it has been for uh, ever since then. So, So that's the origins. A daughter wanting to honor her father for the sacrifices that he made on her behalf. And dads, we recognize the sacrifice that you make on behalf of your family. And we want to recognize you. We want to pray for you. We want to ask God's blessing upon you today. So if your dad is sitting next to you, or if he's not in your heart, just hold their hand and let's just offer a prayer of blessing upon all of our fathers right now. Bless every father and every grandfather with the best of your spiritual blessings today, Lord. Let them know that He's not alone in the task that you've given him to provide for and and support those under his care. Show him how much you delight in his work and affirm the value of whatever you have given him to do, both as a father or grandfather, but also as a child of yours. Confirm his worth daily so that he has no reason to doubt whether he is loved in the eyes of the heavenly father. We pray, Lord, that you create in him a deep sense of trust in you, knowing that he can count on you and help him lead and protect those that depend on him. Let him know that in every, that in every unselfish act of love and encouragement he has offered has been a gift that you received gladly. Show him how effective the prayers of a godly man really are and what a difference he has and can make in those around him, no matter how big or small the assignment. We, we pray that when challenging times push him beyond his limits, that you assure him that he can, you can take him further into the realm of possible impossibilities. Speak deep into his spirit the powerful words he longs to hear from you that nothing can ever separate him from your love. Help him to grasp firmly the promises of your word, standing with faith on the things that you declare are true. Reward him for his faithfulness, faith, faithful past, present, and future. Assure him that true success and satisfaction don't lie in his accomplishments or accolades, but in the steadfast, Christ-like character you are forming within him. Teach him how to meet the needs of his his children. 
and give him the ability to do so and help him to trust in you for strength. Help him to push out any needless fears and grant to him godly wisdom and spiritual guidance to lead and direct those precious children in your paths, knowing he must also release them into your hands with prayerful love. And give him a passionate faith, a persevering spirit, and a powerful testimony that overcomes any weakness or doubt. As he wears the armor of God daily, you have provided for him as a spiritual leader and a child of God. Today, on special days and on all the days of his life, fill him with the best of your blessings so that one day he will stand before you and hear your ultimate words of praise. Well done, my son, well done. This we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Well, it's Father's Day, and we right now are doing a series where we're looking at the parables of Jesus. Uh, Parables were these little stories Jesus would teach that had a, a powerful punch a meaningful message. They, 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 they had a, a purpose, a message that they were trying to communicate to us about him and about his kingdom. So here on Father's Day, I thought there was no more apropos parable to look at than the story of the prodigal son. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. And we are going to look at this story, this parable. And I think it probably should better be called the prodigal sons, plural. Because as we will see, both of these sons were prodigals. And whether a prodigal lives an unrighteous life or a self-righteous life, both can be problematic. And we're going to pick up the story here in verse 11, where Jesus begins to tell us. And he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father. Give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he, the father, divided his wealth between them, between the brothers. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. Apparently, baby brother felt a little stifled living under his father's roof. So he decides now that he's of age to fly the coop, if you would, to spread his wings, to to declare his independence. So he asked his dad for his share of the family fortune and then goes and strikes it out on his own. One of my all-time favorite Bible teachers and authors is a man by the name of Warren Wearsby. And he provides us just a little insight into what's happening here. He says, it was perfectly legal for the younger son to ask for his share of the estate and even to sell it. But it was certainly not a very loving thing to do. It was as though he were saying to his father, Dad, I wish you were dead. Pretty rude. Self-serving. You know, by their very nature, families are are, are social units. And, And families require unselfish interaction. It's about giving and sharing, about waiting and and, and listening. It's about helping and being there for one another. 
A family's health rests on each member's willingness to sacrifice their individual rights for the good of the whole. Or, in the words of the three musketeers, a family needs to be all for one and one for all. But here, the father's younger son isn't thinking about his dad or his brother or his family. All he's concerned about is numero uno. He wants what's coming to him right now. Now, understand, his inheritance was earmarked for him. He he was already in the will, if you would. It's going to be the younger sons eventually, in time. But rather than to respect his father's hard work and his generosity and patiently wait for what was going to be eventually given to him, this boy disses his dad. He kind of feels entitled, like dad owes him, that he is deserving. Uh, Notice verse 13. It says, and not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together. This younger boy evidently wasn't planning on ever returning. In his mind, he was packing up for good. I'm out of here, is what he was thinking. So it goes on in verse 13, say, and he went on a journey into a distant country. Now, the Jews that were listening to Jesus tell this little parable, this little story, probably would have thought when they talked about a distant country of Antioch of Syria. Now, Antioch was known for its lax moral climate and its sensual attractions. Think of Antioch as the Las Vegas of the day. What happens in Antioch stays in Antioch, was the saying, right? So his son is leaving a loving home to go to Sin City. And it says, verse 13, and there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now, some of us might not know. We wonder, why is this story called the prodigal son? Well, the word prodigal means wasteful. And that's what this boy was. He was wasteful. He wasted his father's vast riches. He he, he hit the streets of Antioch, and he joined in on the party scene. He snorted, he drank, he smoked it all away. He used the money to win favor. He used it to buy affection. This younger son hawked his daddy's hard-earned wealth and changed it into cheap thrills. Now, his older brother will later on speak, as we will see, and he will say this of his younger sibling. Look at verse 30. It says, but when this son of yours came, referring to the younger one, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. So so this prodigal son, this wasteful son, adopted an X-rated appetite. He spent his time in the peep shows and at the massage parlors and the strip clubs. He lived a life that, well, it would make a sailor blush. Thomas Huxley wrote, a man's worst difficulty Sorry, a man's worst difficulties begin when he is able to do just as he pleases. 
You know, a true test of a person's character begins when all the restraints are lifted off and there's no one around to tell them what to do. That's when you see your character. When you're all alone and there's nobody to give an account to and nobody knows who you are, how do you behave? A.K.A. the college student, the rookie recruit. So here's a definition of the word character. It's what you are when no one else is looking. And this father's youngest son proved he had very poor and very little moral character. And our heart at this point goes out for this dad, doesn't it? I mean, nothing is more hurtful and painful for a parent than to see their child running wild. Throwing off all discretion. Living a, a, a self-destructive life that, that ignores God, that mocks his word. Nothing is more painful and heartbreaking. The Black College Fund has a saying we all know well. Their motto is, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. This younger son not only wasted a good mind, he spoiled a clear conscience, a healthy body, a tender spirit, a noble reputation, a likable personality. He, he, he wasted all of this in the vain pursuit of pleasure. He threw away his dignity and his integrity for some momentary enjoyments. Hmm. I'll just go on, verse 14. Now, when he, this younger prodigal son, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country. And he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. When this kid first hit town, he had money to burn and everybody was his friend. But now... <laughs> His rowdy friends have abandoned him. This party animal is all alone. See, he's unable to reciprocate a favor, so he receives none. And the only job he can get is feeding pigs. Remember, he is a young Jewish boy. They, they, they skeeved pigs. They, 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 they saw them as unclean. They had nothing to do with them. And now this Jewish boy, the only thing he can find to do was this miserable, embarrassing, humiliating task of feeding swine. And verse 16 informs us of his desperation. It says, and he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating. <laughs> I grew up with pigs on our farm. And I remember, I mean, they were these big old massive hogs. And I remember when feeding time came along and the workers would bring these buckets filled with slop. I don't even know what was in it, but it smelled and it looked disgusting. And they would just pour this slop into the trough. And you know the first thing that the pigs would do? They would tip 
the trough over. So it all fell on the ground, in the mud, mixing with their excrement, and then would begin to eat it. Disgusting. So let's go have some tacos afterwards, right? No. But, but, but just disgusting. So here's this Jewish boy who has been raised to skeeve these swine. All of a sudden is desiring this muck that they're eating. It's just to show us that he hit rock bottom. This boy had walked away from buffet dinners at his father's table and now find himself pigging out with the swine. He's no longer bringing home the bacon. And we're told, verse 16 at the end, it says, and no one was giving anything to him. Do you know the only person that ever gave anything to him was? His father. Because it was his father, his dad, that truly loved him. Now we, verse 17, we get to eavesdrop into what was going on in this young man's mind. What was going on in his thoughts, verse 17. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. Those are some wonderful words that Jesus uses here. But when he came to his senses, when his pride was shattered, for the first time in years, he could finally begin to see things clearly. He remembers the kindness and, 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 and the generosity of his father. His dad treated the hired help better than how what the son was living right at that moment. And just the scraps that fell off of the father's table were a feast for a king compared to what he was having to look at and deal with right now. So that's why this younger son finally concludes, verse 18, I will get up and go. Go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. <laughs> wow. I mean, look at the transformation in his attitude, would you? When he left home, he said, Father, give me the portion of good that falls to me. And now when he's returning home, he says, make me like one of your hired servants. He goes from give me to make me. It's a sign of a person's sanity when he's more concerned with who he is than what he has. And all of a sudden, he begins to care about his character. And that's what you learn in the pig pen. That happiness isn't found in wanting more, but it's found in needing less. The text says that the boy is living in a far country. But verse 20 tells us what he did. Verse 20, he says, so he got up and came to his father. Abraham Piper, the son of the popular preacher John Piper, 
for years renounced his faith and lived his life on the wild side. He tortured his parents. Finally, he returned, he repented, and he renewed his faith. And then he gave some advice for parents of prodigals. He wrote, if he or she has any inkling to be with you, don't make it hard for them. There are instances when parents must give ultimatums, but these should be rare. He gets a little bit more specific. He says, if your daughter stinks like weed or like an ashtray, then spray her jacket down with Febreze and change the sheets on the bed when she leaves, but let her come home. If you find out your daughter is pregnant, Take her to a 20-week ultrasound and protect her from planned parenthood, but by all means, let her come home. If your son is broke because he spent all of his money you lent him on loose women and ritzy liquor, then forgive his debt. Have you been forgiven? Don't give him more money, but let him come home. If he hasn't been around for a while because he's been staying at his girlfriend's apartment, urge him not to go back, but let him come home. Here's the point. If at all possible, let your prodigal come home. Who knows if this trip home won't be the time when he repents of his sin and recommits himself to Christ. This was the obvious attitude of the father in this story. He was so eager that his son, for his son to come home that we read in the second part of verse 20, but while he, the boy, was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion for for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The dad let the prodigal come home. Even after the boy had wished his father dead, even after the boy had wasted his riches, like our father in heaven, the dad in this story showed grace unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor. And he poured out his love upon his son. Love that this boy certainly did not deserve. Now, now we we have to understand that that the, the culture in which Jesus is telling this story, this was a stern Middle Eastern patriarchy in other words in the jewish home the father reigned supreme respect was mandatory and enforced you know in deuteronomy 21 the law said a rebellious son could be taken before the elders judged incorrigible and stoned to death that's the rights the father had over his children We're talking about getting stoned with rocks, not the other stuff. But that's what makes this love of the Father so breathtaking, my friends. He was breaking the cultural norms. This story injects grace in a world that was full of ungrace. Now we get the sense that here's a father who has been watching and waiting every evening. Every night he sits on the front porch with a faraway look in his eye, longing to see his wayward son turn the bed, bend, and come down the home stretch. 
And here he sees his son from afar off. And he doesn't wait for his son to make the journey all the way to him. But he gets up and he runs to his son. Now, in the Middle Eastern societies, elderly men never, ever ran. It was unbecoming. It was shameful. It was dishonoring. And that's what makes this father's action so, so, so stunning. He sees his son off in the distance. He's all overcome with joy and emotion. He jumps off of the porch. He sprints down the long driveway in order to receive his son home. He, he doesn't wait to say, is there really a change of heart in him? I don't see any tears in his eyes. I first need to see some humility in his face. He can't tell any of that because his son is afar off. The dad can barely make out his figure, but he knows it's him. The only thing he's sure of is, that's my son. And he doesn't care if he smells like swine urine. It doesn't bother him that he's filled with pig slop this father runs embraces him and falls on his neck and kisses him the original text here implies that he covers him with kisses You know, it's been said of God that he catches his fish, then he cleanses them. We tend to say we want it cleansed first. But God doesn't wait for us to clean up our act before he loves us. He takes us as is. And if you have a prodigal, this is the love that you need to have toward him. Your kid might smell like slop, or he might be a real stinker. But don't let that stop you from throwing your arms around him and covering his sins with your kisses. Just be hopeful that he's home. I'm not saying give him any more money. <laughs> but let him come home. See, here's the truth about sin. Sin not only breaks a law, it breaks a heart. And if your heart has ever been broken by a prodigal child, you know this to be true. But if you want to represent God to your child, you will have to fight the urge to get bitter or to grow calloused. Be willing to extend the grace that you have received from God. You know what? With Jesus' help, even a wounded heart can forgive one more time. So welcome the prodigals back home. In the 1980s, Mel White was a ghostwriter for several leading evangelical Christians. A ghostwriter is one that he takes your notes and he writes the book for you and you put your name on it. He's just kind of paid to do it. So he wrote several leading evangelical Christians' books. So it was a shock when it came out that he was a closet homosexual. It kind of hit all the big, you know, news and Christian magazines. And so his parents were interviewed and the reporter asked, do you consider your son a sinner? 
And his devout, conservative Christian mom replied, he may be a sinner, be still my pride and joy. See, that's a good blend of grace and truth. She didn't deny her son's sin. But the sin didn't stop her from loving her son. Again, former prodigal Abraham Piper adds this. He says, point them to Christ. Your rebellious child's real problem is not drugs or sex or cigarettes or porn or laziness or crime or cussing or homosexuality or being in a punk band. The real problem is that your child doesn't see Jesus clearly. Jesus will replace whatever they're staking their eternities on right now. Only his grace can draw them from their perilous pursuits to bind them safe and satisfied. Let them come home. And then point them to Jesus. Back to our story. It's not until verse 21 that the younger son finally opens his mouth after being embraced and kissed by his father. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Remember back in the far off country, he, 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 he'd already formed this apology in his mind. He, he thought through what he was going to say. He, he maybe even had little note cards or, or written it on his hand so he wouldn't forget things. And he'd probably been rehearsing it over and over all this journey home. So he launches into it hoping his father is going to accept him back as a hired hand. But the father doesn't even let him finish. The father cuts him off. Verse 22. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found and they began to celebrate. So before this kid could even finish his well-planned and rehearsed apology, the father orders the servants to fetch the vestments of sonship. Notice, not just a robe, but the best robe, it says. Not just bring it to him, but put it on him. The, the, the father even tells his servants, put a ring on his finger. The ring was the seal of the family business. It was the signature. He's entrusting him once again. He says, put sandals on his feet. It was only slaves that went barefoot. Sons wore sandals. And he says, bring the fatted calf. For this father, the son's salvation was cause for a family celebration. But you know what? Obviously, there's no thought in this father's mind of his son doing penance or serving a probationary period. Or, or spending a few years to prove his sincerity. But rather we see he's instantly received and restored to his place in the family. Now I'm not sure that the father could see the changes of heart that occurred in the son. When the kid left home, he was into himself, but now he's coming back willing to sign up to serve. I'm sure this father would have taken a different track if the kid had come home with hostility still in his heart. 
See, it's not love to enable prodigal to be more wasteful. But this dad shows how fully and freely he forgives and how fully and freely forgiveness should flow when it's greeted with real repentance. You know what's ironic? Everything that this younger son hoped to find in the far off country he discovers is in his father's home. He went out looking for a party and he found the best party when he came back under his father's roof. So what's the message to us? First of all, maybe you're a prodigal. Maybe you have strayed away from your heavenly father. Maybe you've decided to imbibe in the living of pleasure, of experience. But now you are suffering and reaping the consequences, the loneliness, the hurt, the pain of those sinful actions. But the shame is so great. The feeling of how could God ever forgive me after what I've done, the things I've said, especially me, I knew better. I want you to know that our Heavenly Father is gazing in the horizon, waiting and longing for the day that you choose to come home. And he will receive you with open arms and showers of kisses and embrace you and restore you and love on you. All you have to do is come back home. Or maybe you have a prodigal. A son or a daughter. Who's rebelled against ways that you've raised them and taught them and wanted for them. Make this story your model and your prayer. That this be your hope for them. That Lord, bring them back. Help, help them see the emptiness of where they're at. And that they remember all that, is, that they're looking for is being provided here in their home and pray that the Lord will bring them back and when they come back receive them with mercy and forgiveness and restoration it's a great lesson for us I'm sure you realize that this is a parable, which is a, a literary device that teaches us a deeper truth. And Jesus is illustrating God's love for sinners. The beautiful love that this dad has toward his wayward son is a picture of the heavenly father's love for us. A story comes out of Spain about an estranged relationship between a father and son. The son had rebelled and, and fled from home. And the father began searching the country ride for his runaway child, but to no avail. Finally, his journey led to the crowded capital of Madrid. How was he going to find his son in the midst of such a vast throng of people? 
So he came up with an idea. And he placed an ad in a newspaper with that read, Dear Paco, meet me in front of the cathedral at noon tomorrow. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. So the next day at noon, 800 men named Paco gathered in front of the cathedral. You see, the father's plea had struck a chord in the hearts of estranged sons throughout the city. It stirred up a desire that's common in every single human being, and that's the need to be forgiven. A secular commentator once wrote of our modern age, it's amazing that in an irreligious culture like ours, the sense of guilt is so deep spread and deep rooted. We've been told there's no such thing as sin. That guilt is unnecessary. <laughs> Yet we feel so guilty. See, deep down inside, prodigal people still long for forgiveness. But what's scarier than the prodigal is for him or her to come home to a family where there is no forgiveness. And if our Savior lives in us, how can we not love and forgive that is why the scariest scenario isn't the prodigal who wakes up in the pig pen and wonders, what in the world have I done? The scarier attitude is a self-righteous brother living in the home, unwilling to forgive, oblivious to his own sin. One Sunday school teacher just finished teaching Luke chapter 15, and she reviewed it with her class. The teacher said, who was sad when the younger son returned? The obvious answer would be the elder brother, right? But little Billy raised his hand, he says, the fatted calf. <laughs> well, there's two very sad characters in this story, the fatted calf and the older brother. Look, verse 25. Now, the older son was in the field. He was hard at work. He was doing his duty. He was fulfilling his responsibility. And when he came and approached the house and heard music and dancing, he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come home and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in so older bro is sitting on the porch pouting why him and not me why does he receive the fatted calf why does he receive the celebration i'm the one that has been at home i am the one that has been faithful See, here's a fellow who obeyed his father outwardly, but had none of the compassion, none of the mercy, none of the love or the kindness of his father. The boy had lived un for years under his father's roof, but he never understood his father's heart. The elder brother served his father but it was never out of a labor of love. He was, all he was doing was racking up pride points, inflating his ego, building his case for a bigger piece of the pie once his old man bit the dust. It's not as obvious, but he too is sinful. And this older boy resents all the fuss that the younger brother is getting. All the years his brother has been down, it has lifted him up. And in verse 29, it's from his lips that we learn that the younger son consorted with harlots. Apparently, this older brother had been keeping tabs on his younger brother from a distance. 
So this older brother is self-righteous. He's arrogant. He's uncaring. And on top of it all, he's oblivious to his own prideful sin. He could enumerate his brother's sin, but he was blind to his own. The father, his family, his friends all bubbled over with joy while he boiled with resentment. His father partied inside while he was pouting outside. I once talked to a man who told me he was glad he was going to hell. I tried to share Jesus with him, but he mocked me. He said, man, hell is where all the babes and the booze are going to be. I'm going to hell so I can party. He had it backwards. There's no parties in hell. The party takes place in a father's house. Heaven is a party. The shouts, the laughter, the making merry is coming from inside the father's house. Outside, the brother is pouting. And that's what we need to know about hell. It's full of powders. Hell is full of suckling, resentful, angry folk, mad at the world. Nobody in hell is in the mood to party. They all burn with envy. Everybody in hell thinks they deserve better. Hell is full of self-righteous people who can see everybody's sin but their own. It won't be a party, it'll be a feud. People will spit on each other's faces, stab each other in the back, gossip and envy, resentment and bitterness, put downs and personal attacks will be commonplace. Hell will be a constant infight and perpetual turmoil and nobody will be there to break it up. Notice verse 28. At the end, it says, and his father came out and began pleading with him. This father, no biases. It's amazing. He's willing to run down the road to his wayward son, but he's just as willing to leave the party for the porch to reason with his eldest son. But this is what I hope you see this morning. The world we live in is one great big family. And it's full of prodigals. And prodigals come in two varieties, the unrighteous and the self-righteous, the heathen and the hypocrite, the lustful and the legalistic. One prodigal wastes his father's riches, the other prodigal wastes his father's grace. We're all prodigals. And verse 29 records the older boy's beef with his dad. Verse 29, he says, And he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you. I have never neglected a command of yours, and yet you have never given me a young goat so that I may celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes, he's not my brother, but this son of yours, he's angry. And in his mind, it's justifiable. It's not fair. He says, and then when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. How does this work? A dad who rewards perversity. And as not saying, what kind of father are you? So in verse 31, the father explains his heart to his son. He says, and he said to him, son, you've always been with me. And all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice. For this brothers of yours was dead and has begun to live, was lost and has been found. The older brother made a tragic mistake. Mistake. He never properly interpreted his relationship with his dad. He'd always been loved by his father as much as his kid brother. Every act of kindness showed the younger had or eventually be shown to him. 
His father love had never been conditioned on either boy's behavior or obedience. The father in the story had always loved them both freely and fully. In a healthy family, everyone gets loved the same because grace reigns. You don't have to buy for favor or earn a family's acceptance. Love is unconditional. Now, now certainly, a child's behavior will, will deem whether he can be trusted with specific responsibilities. But the privilege to be loved is a free gift. It springs from a parent's heart. It should be extended with no strings attached. The divine love is never earned, only received. But the older brother tried to turn a family of grace into this legalistic family by creating a sliding scale based on his own performance rather than entrusting and receiving. There's a story told of a painter who was commissioned to paint a portrait of the prodigal son, but he needed a model. So he went out to the slums of the city and found a man that was filthy from head to toe. The man's eyes were bloodshot, his hair was disheveled, his clothes were tattered. He was perfect specimen. So the painter asked him to report to his studio at 10 a.m. the next morning. Well, at 10 a.m. the next morning, the artist walked into the lobby of his studio and he found a gentleman. Clean cut, well-groomed, nicely dressed. He said, how can I help you? He said, well, you told me to be here at 10 a.m. And the painter peered at the man's face and recognized the features of him. That It was the bum he had found the day before on the street. But the man's effort to clean himself up caused the painter to send him away. And that's the moral of this parable. Though the older brother had lived his life, hadn't, um, the older brother hadn't lived his life on the wild side, and that's a good thing, because he was spared many painful consequences. Nevertheless, in the man's heart, he was just as corrupt as his brother. He was filled with pride and selfishness. The older brother had just dressed himself up in this facade of respectability and pretended to be worthy of his dad's love. And to be honest, this can be scarier than outright rebellion. Because we deceive ourselves. But we see the father put a robe on the boy who was honest. But he stripped his prideful son of his selfish conceit. Somewhere along the line, the older brother got the false notion he deserved his father's blessings, and the younger brother didn't. But in truth, neither of the brothers deserved the father's wealth. The father's wealth and favor and blessing had always been a free gift initiated by his grace. And that's exactly how it works in God's family. There might be a prodigal amongst us today. And I just want you to know that even though you wasted God's gifts and blessings, he still loves you. And he'll run to you when you decide to come home. But there might also be elder brothers here today. You were raised in church, saved at an early age. You've been married to the same person your whole life. You've never lied on your taxes or st stuck a store item in your purse without paying for it. You're moral, but you've lacked love. 
Because secretly you think yourself better than others, even maybe other Christians. You know more. You've made more sacrifices. You've cleaned up your life more. What's wrong with them, you think? You look down your nose and resent it when God does for others what he doesn't do for you. Let's check our hearts. See, the world, even our own families, are made up of two prodigals. And life is too short to be either one of them. Don't be the wasteful son. Throwing away the blessings and the inheritance God has set aside for you. Don't be the bitter brother who harbored a selfish grudge and failed to celebrate God's gift. And if you're either one, then come to the loving Father who longs for you to return. And no matter where you come from and what you've done, he accepts you with open arms and kisses and grace. Not for anything that you have done, but because of who he is. A God of love. That is our Father. And that is the Father we celebrate today, along with our physical fathers, our Heavenly Father, Lord. You who have loved us so perfectly, so unconditionally, we thank you. And I want to pray for any of us, Lord, who might be wayward. Maybe we have strayed from the path that we have been taught and ventured into sin and pleasure seeking and everything else. I pray that we just might see sooner rather than later how empty it all is and that everything we truly long for, everything we're truly seeking is found in our Father's home in you so that we might return. Remove any fear to help us to see that you are a loving, caring Father looking and longing for us, desiring us. But there might be some here who are prideful, maybe even arrogant. Looking back at all of their accomplishments and what they've done in the name of Christ, thinking that they are deserving of your blessings and grace. And that we might realize that we are no better. No better than the rebellious, licentious individual. That we too, and it's only because of your grace that we can draw near. Thank you for being so loving, so caring, so patient, and so merciful, Lord. And we celebrate you and thank you this Father's Day for your perfect love. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's stand and let's worship our heavenly
eyes to see my king in majesty your grace compels my soul to love and draw in close I'll lift my hands and sing so Now until forever, Jesus, I surrender. Show me what I don't know more of you. I'm desperate for your presence, longing to be with you. Lead me to a new place, more of you. Through the fire, I'll pursue. Submit to anything where I go, you've been before. All my trust is in you, Lord. Now, into forever, Jesus, I surrender. Show me what I don't. Spread for your presence, longing to be with you. Lead me to a new place for me. Lead us back to Forever, Lord, I will pursue, I will pursue. You for my heart, Jesus, you're all that I want, all that I want. Lead me, lead me to you, forever.
into fear. Jesus, I surrender. Show me what I don't know more of you. I'm desperate for your presence, longing to be with. Lead me to a new place. 